letter from Annie Richmond to Mariah Flynn, October 10, 1849. Dear Muddy, oh my mother, my darling, darling mother, what shall I say to you? How can I comfort you? Oh mother, it seems more than I can bear, and when I think of you, his mother, who has lost her all, I feel that it must not. No, it cannot be. Oh, if I could but see you, do I implore you, come to Annie as soon as possible. Come, dear mother, and I will be indeed a daughter to you. Oh, if I could only have laid down my life for his, that he might have been spared to you. But, mother, it is the will of God, and we must submit, and heaven grant us strength to bear it. We shall soon be beloved and lost to us here in that blessed world where there are no partings. Your letter has this moment reached me, but I had been a notice of his death a few moments previous in the paper. Oh, mother, when I read it, I said, no, no, it is not true. My Eddie can't be dead. No, it is not so. I could not believe it until I got your letter. Even now, it seems impossible, for how can it be? How can I bear it? And how, oh, how can his poor, poor mother bear it and live? Oh God, is it not too much? Forgive me, mother, but I cannot bear to submit without a murmur. I know it is wrong, but mother, I cannot. Had my own been taken, I could have been reconciled and comforted, for I have kind parents, brother and sister left, but he, he was all, all she had. God in mercy, comfort, and sustain her, for it is more than she can bear. Pardon me if I add one pang to your grief, dear mother, but my own heart is breaking, and I cannot offer you consolation, but I would now. But mother, I will pray for you, and for myself, that I may be able to comfort you. Mr. Richmond begs that you will come on here as soon as you can, and stay with us as long as you please. Oh, dear mother, gather up all his papers and books, and take them and come to your own Annie, who will do everything in her power to make you comfortable and reconcile to the bitter lot heaven has ordained for you. Do not deny me this privilege, dear mother. My heart will nearly break if you do not come. Write me, but if one word, soon as you get this. The mail closes in ten minutes. I must stop. My darling, darling mother. God in heaven bless and sustain you and bring you safely to your home. Faithful and a dream within a dream. Take this kiss upon the brow, and in parting from you now, thus much let me avow. You are not wrong who deem that my days have been a dream. Yet if hope has flown away in a night or in a day, in a vision or in none, is it therefore the less gone? All that we see or seem is but a dream within a dream. I stand amid the roar of a surf-tormented shore, and I hold within my hand grains of the golden sand. How few, yet how they creep through my fingers to the deep. While I weep, while I weep, O oh God, can I not grasp them with a tighter clasp? O oh God, can I not save one from the pitiless wave? Is all that we see or see but a dream within a dream? Letter from Mr. Nelson Poe to Mrs. Clem, Baltimore, October 11, 1849. My dear madam, I would to God I could console you with the information that your dear son Edgar A. Poe is still among the living. The newspapers in announcing his death have told only a truth which we may weep over and deplore, but cannot change. He died on Sunday morning about five o'clock at the Washington Medical College where he had been since Wednesday preceding. At what time he arrived in this city, where he spent the time he was here, or under what circumstances I have been unable to ascertain. It appears that on Wednesday he was seen and recognized as one of the places of election in Old Town, and that his condition 
was such as to render it necessary to send him to the college where he was tenderly nursed until the time of his death. As soon as I heard that he was at the college, I went over, but his physicians did not think it advisable that I should see him, as he was very excitable. Well, the next day I called and I sent him changes of linen, and he was gratified to learn that, well, I was gratified that he was much better. And I was never so much shocked in my life that when on Sunday morning, notice was sent to me that he was dead. Mr. Herring and myself immediately took the necessary steps for his funeral, which took place on Monday afternoon at 4 o'clock. He lies alongside his ancestors in the Presbyterian burial ground on Green Street. I assure you, my dear madam, that if I had known where a letter could reach you, I would have communicated the melancholy tidings in time to enable you to attend the funeral. But I was wholly unaware of how to address you. The body was followed to the grave by Mr. Herring, Dr. Snodgrass, Mr. Z. Collins Lee, and myself. The service was performed by the Reverend William T. D. Clem, a son of James T. Clem, no distant relative. Mr. Herring and myself have sought in vain for the trunk and clothes of Edgar. There is reason to believe that he was robbed of them whilst in a condition as to render him insensible of his loss. I shall not attempt the useless task of consoling you under such a bereavement. Edgar has seen so much of sorrow, had so little reason to be satisfied with life, that to him the change can scarcely be said to be a misfortune. If it leaves you lonely in this world of trouble, may I be allowed the friend the privilege of expressing the hope that in the contemplation of all the world to which he has gone and to which we are all hastening, you will find consolations enduring and all sufficient. I shall be glad at all times to hear from you and to alleviate in every way in my power the sorrows to which this dispensation may expose you. I only wish my ability was equal to my disposition. My wife unites with me in expression of sympathy Truly your friend and servant, Nelson Poe. Annabelle Lee, it was many and many a year ago in a kingdom by the sea that a maiden lived, whom you may know, by the name of Annabelle Lee. And this maiden, she lived with no other thought than to love and be loved by me. I was a child, and she was a child in this kingdom by the sea. But we loved with a love that was more than love, and I and my Annabelle Lee, with the love that the winged serpents of heaven coveted her and me. And this was the reason that, long ago in the kingdom by the sea, a wind blew out of a cloud, chilling my beautiful Annabelle Lee, so that her high-born kinsman came and bore her away from me, to shut her up in a sepulchre in a kingdom by the sea. The angels, not half so happy in heaven, when envying her and me, yes, that was the reason, as all men know, in the kingdom by the sea, that the wind came out of the cloud that by night, chilling and killing my Annabelle Lee. But our love, it was stronger by far than the love of those who were older than we, of many far wiser than we, and neither the angels in heaven above nor the demons down under the sea can ever dissever my soul from the soul of the beautiful Annabelle Lee. For the moon never beams without bringing me dreams of the beautiful Annabelle Lee. And the stars never rise, but I feel the bright eyes of the beautiful Annabelle Lee. And so, all the night tide, I lie down by the side of my darling, my darling, my life, and my bride, in her self there by the sea, in her tomb by the sounding sea.